Hi, I'm Janice Switlow, and today's discussion is really a follow-up on uh, the episode titled uh, Canada Shot the Sheriff. I encourage you to review that one first. It's a little bit longer one um, before proceeding to, to today's episode. Uh, and today I want to describe a couple of, uh, uh, you know, continuing on with this idea that, you know, law was just kind of made up. Um, it carried on. Um, so I'm focusing on two men from uh, quote-unquote BC. Uh, you know, Sir James Douglas, chief factor of the Hudson's Bay Company, and also hanging judge, uh, Judge Matthew uh, Bailey Begbie. And I want to also describe also RCMP in terms of how, what was the approach to law um, taking place in this frontier area. Uh, you know, it says uh, Douglas was a giant well above six feet. As a young man, he had a quick temper, furiously violent when roused, as Sir George Simpson, a Hudson's Bay Company governor, put it. Douglas once invaded an Indian village single-handed after a murderer, found his man, and, according to one version, quote, blew out his brains in, f in the center of his tribe, end of quote. This was the first to become the first governor of BC, the colony of BC. And so, of course, during this time, you know, gold rush um, in BC, um, you know, Douglas hoped this gold rush would bring prosperity to his colony. He knew that the Queen's men were few and without power. Remember, there's no treaties in place here. Maintaining order would have to be more a matter of presence and implied retribution. And so he warned the freewheeling gold seekers that, quote, the law of the land will do its work without fear and without favor, end of quote. Now, interesting, because the law of the land at this time is actually the law, the indigenous law of the indigenous nations of the area. So he was, you know, and he, him being, I suggest, well aware of that, um, saying we have no real power because there's no permissions from the owners of the land. Um, and the law of the land was indeed understood to be that of the indigenous nations. Uh, continuing, in a lesser man, this warning would have been bluster. In Douglas's case, by the solemn act of asserting that there was law and authority, he created both. You know, uh, under what law? <laughs> Can you go somewhere? This is like the plant the flag. I say it's my law that applies here, and so it does. This is the f continuing uh, approach of, of colonies in Canada. You know, just to say, I just have to say it, you know. Um, I wonder if you say it three times if it works to call that into effect. Um, you know, and, and it says, you know, he, there was a problem that arose um, in the, on the Fraser's mouth. Uh, Douglas went at the problem in the dual role of stern parent and adroit politician. He first lectured the Indians severely on keeping the peace, and then bestowed a small government sinecure upon their leader, gave him some, you know, some money. The grateful chief responded by assuring Douglas of his unswerving loyalty and led his braves back to their village. Douglas next turned to the gathering of miners and sharply advised them they were present merely on sufferance, that no abuses would be tolerated, and that the laws would protect the rights of the Indian no less than those of the white man. The miners listened to this imposing man and peacefully dispersed. Again, remember, um, you know, there's still indigenous law in effect. So, you know, it was this, I'm a big, huge, empower, you know, powerful looking man, and I just say things, and people, you know, just believe it. That really hasn't changed a lot, you know, in terms of how Indigenous nationals are dealt with, you know, chiefs and councils at tables, um, you know, the imposing, all-knowing um, and concerned, um, 
Canadian representatives, you know, all the while conniving to obtain a termination of the nations and, and hence the treaties. So turning now to the judge, Judge Begbie. Begbie's quick and personal method of disposing of his first case set a style he would follow for many years as he presided over the administration of justice in British Columbia and Vancouver Island. As a jurist, he knew little formal law, and he did not like law books, complaining they were both confused and confusing. He had been an indifferent student at Cambridge, much preferring the more stimulating pursuits of rowing, boxing, tennis, singing, acting, card playing, traveling, and the company of females. But if he lacked book learning, he had something better suited to rough mining camps, a commanding presence, a powerfully developed morality, and a bold willingness to act on his convictions. He was as tall as or taller than Governor, Je uh, Governor um, Douglas, bearded, handsome, with a voice that rose incongruously high when he was angry, as was often the case. In addition, he owed, owned a lively sense of dignity regarding a queen's court. He had with him at all times a wig and judicial robes and never held court without donning them, whether in a miner's cabin, a barn, a saloon, or on horseback in an open field. Uh, you know, he left little doubt where he stood in all matters on one occasion when the jury acquitted a man of assault in a barroom battle. His honor coldly addressed the accused, quote, prisoner at the bar, the jury have said you are not guilty. You can go and I devoutly hope the next man you sandbag will be one of the jury, end of quote. Uh, being naturally endowed with a temperament for it, Begbie accumulated enemies more readily than most men. Um, his size was intimidating. So not, you know, not concerned about the rule of law, uh, just intimidation, right? Um, the foundation, if you will, of expanding the Dominion of Canada to include these colonies. Now remember, the following uh, descriptions and quotes that I'll be providing, this was all after treaties were uh, in place. Um, by late December, this is 1870, uh, 1869, yeah, uh, Ottawa had begun to take the Métis serious enough to realize that some sort of conciliation was imperative. But the idea rankled Prime Minister MacDonald, the first Prime Minister. These compulsive half-breeds have got spoiled, he complained sourly, and must be kept down by a strong hand until they are swamped by the influx of settlers. Yet MacDonald could see the wisdom of a velvet glove on the strong hand, so he sent a persuasive Hudson's Bay Company official, Donald Smith, to assure the Métis that Canada's intentions toward them were benevolent. Twice Smith addressed assemblages, assemblages of 1,000 Métis, assuring them that his sole object was to, quote, bring about peaceably union and entire accord among all the classes of the people of this land. Smith's mission had no authority to commit Ottawa to anything. Yet his assurances of good faith were believed. It's the same darn thing that's happening at tables everywhere. They are telling those there, the Indigenous Nationals, the Chiefs, for instance, what they want to hear. They are approaching it with that velvet glove on a strong hand. They are keeping things tight. You know, where, where was that 2%? Was it ever lifted? You know, it was a campaign promise at one time by the majority, um, that resulted in a majority Liberal government. Um, I haven't heard anything about that actually being lifted. I might have missed it, um, but I would have, you know, and so squeezing, you know, um, to, to ensure that in desperation, chiefs will come to the table and of course will embrace sweet words. This has always been part of the tactic and the, and the, the growth of Canada towards nationhood 
and it, these outlaw uh, nation activities. Now, by the end of um, 1874, Northwest Mounted Police had been deployed, and uh, so they did what they could in their own interests, as well as the Indians to improve sanitation and prevent epidemics among the tribes. They worked hard as justices of the peace to make fair decisions for both Indians and whites. And when a Mountie's knowledge of the law failed him, he improvised. Quote, we make up the law as we go along, end of quote, one inspector calmly informed an irate whiskey trader whom he had arrested. Again, just whatever the individual thinks. This is the so-called rule of law that has developed and shaped what we know as Canada, the Dominion of Canada today, which is still its legal name. Now, uh, you know, in summer of 1879, where the buffalo were, were gone, and uh, it says families were eating grass, mice, carrion, and their bony dogs and horses. When Ottawa realized that Indians were actually starving to death, it sent the Mountie posts emergency shipments of provisions and troopers in ox carts trundled about distributing tons of beef, bacon, and flour. But the relief shipments made barely a dent in the epic hundred hunger of thousands of Indians. Now remember, this was a contrived thing. It was intended to, to, to starve them. At Fort Walsh alone, 5,000 Sioux, Crees, Blackfeet, and Bloods were begging for food. The post commanders gave out the Mounties emergency provisions, and the policemen went so far as to share food from their own meals. Table scraps from the mess halls were a prize Indians would fight for. Let that sink in a bit, because once the short-term uh, flow of money stops because Canada gets what it wants, I've warned the domestic ethnic minority is only left with the ability to beg. No longer the owners that can hold in check, and I appreciate a lot of people don't know how to do this yet, but in law, right, there actually is law. There actually is a requirement to comply with law. Canada is an outlaw nation and continues to progress on that path. Canada needs to be roped back onto where we should be. Where could we be right now if a lawful process would have been followed, if the terms of the treaties were actually complied with, you know, if everyone acted honorably. You know, it says that, you know, once the Canadian Pacific Railway was the dominant fact of life through the prairies, for instance, um, besides hordes of construction workers, the Canadian Pacific Railway brought self-willed farmers from the east, polyglot immigrants from Europe, rambunctious cowboys from the United States with cattle to start Canadian herds, and from almost everywhere, resurgent whiskey traders, ambitious harlots, imaginative confidence men, and unscrupulent merchants who gave Indians the labels from canned goods as change for their annuity dollars. Now, a couple things there. Obviously, the, the, you know, the, the theft in, in passing off labels as money to um, Indigenous nationals who were you know, not accustomed yet to uh, how money is used as a trade item. Um, but consider this change for the annuity dollars, right? Um, <laughs> those annuity dollars represented a significant income that, you know, once they've gotten their provisions, they're actually getting change back, or theoretically we're supposed to get change back. Um, so that also calls to attention the fact that um, the cost of living, the, the $5 has not been properly indexed. I mean, who today could pay the same amount of rent that they could pay you know, a hundred years ago. Think about that, right? And it's not a matter for going into the courts to say, uh, these need to be increased. 
it is a matter of diplomacy. It is a matter of renegotiating the rent, not having to give up who you are and what you have in order to get your proper rent. Uh, you know, Canada says, oh, okay, well, we'll give you some stuff. But, you know, as always, every single tactic, every single initiative, Indigenous nationals are led to believe they're getting something new and good and above. And they're actually through the back door losing far more than they could, that they're actually, you know, gaining. You know, again, another description. You know, the Indians had been told that the government would feed them. But in 1883, when the exchequer was low, the treasury, you know, the money, one of the first things cut back was Indian rations. Later that year, an Indian agent called his charges mere skeletons. Wrote an interpreter in the winter of 1884, the Indians are starving very badly. I fear that most of these people will not see spring. Most whites shrugged off the Indian's predicament. A few understood that it was a prelude to chaos. It is poor, yes, false economy to cut down the expenditure so closely in connection with the feeding of the Indians, warned Superintendent Leif Crozier of the Mounted Police in 1884. It would seem as if there was a wish to see upon how little a man can exist. They should be humored a little. My firm conviction is if some such policy as I have outlined is not carried out, there is only one other, and that is to fight them. But the treaties are in place. They could not engage in threatening the peace through um, armed warfare. Uh, the whole purpose, uh, and, and, and there's no exit provisions, um, and to break, you know, to, to do so would to, would completely undermine um, the treaties. So you have here, you know, mounted police who themselves take an oath to protect the interests of the crown, for instance, um, you know, trying to, to stand up to protect the people, but you have the politicians and the government saying, no, 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 we, we want to starve these people. Um, you know, and of course, this was in 1884, are we going to go back to the same situation because indigenous nationals are being tricked into giving up who they are and what they have and will therefore not have any leverage? Remember, these were illegal actions of the governments, the Canadian governments, illegal actions. But if they get, get you, if they get you signed in and under, then it's a matter of being up front. Well, it's all subject to appropriations. If we've got the money, then we'll give you something. You are then, you know, the ancestors that went through this, those that died of starvation, how can you proceed on a basis that will allow Canada to lawfully do what they did back then on an unlawful basis? Let, let me just clarify that, okay? Treaties, responsible, the relationship, rent, etc. You go under Canada, treaties fall. If you're a domestic ethnic minority, minorities who are only left to beg and lobby, and minorities do not put in majority governments. You know, they don't have that power. By definition, they're the minority. The majority will decide how their money is spent without owing anything to the Indigenous nationals because they're no more. They're only Canadians at that point. So the Indigenous nationals go from the top requirement that Canadian governments are supposed to be paying first, if you will, and protecting and, and ensuring their status of, of life and living um, to the bottom you know, getting the crumbs back to those times of fighting. And you will be fighting, fighting over the scraps from the tables. Um, that's just not something I can endorse and recommend as a way forward for future generations of Indigenous nationals. Hang on to your nationhood. Hang on to who you are. And you will set your own table 
and will be served first. And that's all I have to say.